One, one. One, one, yeah. Jesus, Jesus, there we go, testing, go ahead, you guys, you guys good, you guys good? One, one, one. Testing, no, no. Linda's isn't done. Testing, 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 testing. Pink Mike isn't done. Testing, all right, happy Sabbath everyone. Testing, all right. We are going to get started with our divine Testing. testing. And we are going to start with some music. I don't know about you, but I am Hello. so happy to be here. What about you? Amen. Oh, amen. That was just three of you. That was just three of you. Let me go. Here. If you're happy to be here, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. One, two. Amen. One, one, one. Testing. John, chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. No, there's no question. No question. Okay. 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 Thank okay. you. Amen, amen. Thank you also to the sound people. Right on. We are going to get started with our divine service. And we're going to sing some praises this morning. And it says in John chapter 15, verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. There's no question that Jesus loves us. But the question is, do you love Jesus? If you love Jesus, say amen. 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 Oh, amen, amen, amen. So come we, come we that love the Lord. And let our joys be known. Join in the song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne. I invite you to please stand with us as we sing Marching to Zion. Amen, amen. Every voice lifted to God. Here we go. Let's go. Come we that love the Lord. Let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne. And thus surround the throne. Oh, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to heavenly Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse, let those refuse to sing, who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King, but children of Take it up a little higher. Of God, then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds. Oh, Marching, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to heavenly Zion. The beautiful city of God. We're marching upward to heavenly Zion. The beautiful city of God. We're marching upward to heavenly Zion. The beautiful city of God. We're marching upward to heav
One more time, we're marching to Zion. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to heavenly Zion, that beautiful city of God. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated at this time. We're going to sing our theme song. Now, the theme song is a little newer for many of us. It's, it's kind of like the hymn, Take the Name, but it's a little different. It goes something like this. So we're going to sing it two times, okay? So if you can listen to it the first time, and then I apologize in advance. I'm going to have to invite you to stand because it's going to be our opening song also, okay? But the first time, just sit, relax, listen. The melody is so simple. It's easy. But the, and I'm going to invite you to stand later on, okay? So the first time around, just listen to how it goes. Here we go. Take the name of Jesus with you, making friends for the Lord. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. Let your Alright, I invite you to please stand with us. Please stand with us as we sing it one more time. Take the name of Jesus with you. Here we go. Take the name of Jesus with you, making friends for the Lord. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. Let your name Chorus once again, let your name, let your name live in me, unreserved, flowing free. May your grace give us life, and your name be glorified. Amen. Let me hear you say amen. Let me take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you to Camp Meeting uh, 2017. Our theme this year is Living Generously, Our Hope and Holdness. Moreover, I want to extend a very warm welcome to those of you who are attending for the first time. Whether you are passing by or just looking for a warm place to worship, you've come to the right place. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father and God, we not only invite you into this place, we invite you to take your rightful place upon our hearts. Lead and guide us throughout this day and know that you are welcome always within our hearts. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Hey, we're running a little bit late, but I want to give a shout out to our sound system people because right in the middle of Sabbath school, there was an amp blew out and all of those who were sitting in the front, you started like, why can't we hear anything? Everybody in the back goes, sounds great because you could hear it back there, but you couldn't hear it up there, but they got everything switched over and I think you can hear us now, right? So we're running a little behind, so I hope you're hope you be patient. By the way, it is camp meeting and it's okay, right? So we're glad that you're here, and I want to just say welcome 
to you as well and uh, to all of the participants that are on the platform. We um, are glad to be able to worship with you. We have one other introduction that I want to make today. I want to invite Craig and Carissa Carr to come up and um, want to just introduce them briefly here. Craig and Carissa are um, coming to us from the Rocky Mountain Conference. As you know, I um, served in this conference for many years as the Vice President of Administration, and um, now we need a new Vice President of Administration, and that's who Craig and Carissa Carr are. So Craig is going to be doing that. Uh, he comes to us where he's been, yes, there we go. Craig comes to us from the Rocky Mountain Conference, uh, where he's been serving as the Ministerial Director for the last five years, if I got the resume right? Four years, okay, four years. Before that, he was the pastor, senior pastor at Boulder. He has a background in business uh, from Union College, served in the business world for a while, and then God just got a hold of him and said, no, you really need to be a preacher. So uh, he has been doing that, and uh, Carissa, equally talented, has a master's degree in education, has been serving as a teacher and vice principal at a school there in Colorado. They have two children. And one just graduated, and uh, why don't you tell us about your kids? You know more about them than I do, so. Um. All right. Yeah, don't get me started about my kids. Um, our daughter Cassie just graduated from Campion Academy and is headed to Southern Adventist University. Our son Christian will be a junior at Auburn Adventist Academy. There you go. So there you go. Yeah, your, your work is done for that, recruitment. But um, I know what some of you were thinking, particularly in the back, didn't they just introduce a bald guy with a beard named Craig? <laughs> so I, I guess the secret is you just hire people named Craig. There we go. So, there we go. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Jerry and I have been wondering which one of them we're going to ask to change their name, because we're not sure how we're going to address each one. But uh, we're glad that they're on the, on, on the team. And uh, some of you looked at your program and you saw that on Sunday night it said Doug Bing was going to be preaching. Well, you've all heard me preach before, so when we found out they were coming, we've asked them to speak, so I would encourage you to be here Sunday night and you'll be able to be introduced to them a little bit more, and they'll be around campus today and tomorrow as well. They're not fully moved here yet, but we're looking forward to them being on board in July. So please pray for us as we continue to work here and pray for them as they go through all of the moving parts of a transition. As anybody that knows that has moved knows that's a challenging time. So we're glad that they're part of our team. Well, the trick isn't to hire bald guys named Craig. The, the trick is just to hire bald guys. <laughs> Amen. You don't realize there's an advantage to being bald. I know when it's raining a few seconds before anybody else. I, you know, I'll say, honey, it's starting to rain. She'll say, it's not raining. I'm like, hey. The meter never lies. I've got some wonderful people to introduce this morning. Pastor Nehemiah, he's our, what I, what I tell people, he's our third conference evangelist because he's just doing a fantastic work. He has Pamela with him, and Pamela is no stranger to camp meeting. She's no stranger to our church. In fact, at one time, she traveled with uh, Jack and Deanna Cologne. I'm not sure if Jack and Deanna are here. They might be out doing an evangelistic meeting somewhere, but Jack and Deanna Cologne had a huge impact on uh, Pamela's life. Pamela left the church for about 16 years. Even though she was traveling and doing soul winning, she left the church for about 16 years. She's given me permission to uh, share part of her journey. But Pamela had a sister who continued to pray. Are you praying for your siblings and family members today? We are excited that Pamela is here, and we are excited that Pastor Nehemiah is here, and that we get to see Pamela baptized. Happy Sabbath, church family. I'd like to invite Pamela's uh, brother and sister-in-law to please stand, and also the Maple Valley Church family, if you would please stand at this time in support of uh, our new family member. I just have three simple questions to ask you, Sister Pamela. Do you love the Lord Jesus with all of your heart, mind, and soul? I do. Do you believe with all of your heart that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven all of your sins and has given you a new heart? I do. Amen. Is it your desire, symbolized through baptism, to join 
God's last day movement, the remnant church, the seventh day Adventist church. Yes, I do. Praise the Lord. It is a privilege as a minister of the gospel to baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to introduce my Lele. This is the next young lady who's going to be heading into the baptistry. She is actually Pastor Nehemiah's niece. And she's been going to school in central Washington. She's been studying her Bible. She loves Jesus. And she told Pastor Nehemiah that this summer she wants to make a public declaration by being baptized here at camp meeting. Praise the Lord. One of the things I'm going to have to talk to the Lord about is, when, I, when we get to glory, is how in the world did he allow all of my nephews and nieces to become taller than me? <laughs> but it's okay. I want to invite her mother and her father, my brother, Fia, Sister Carol, and their family to stand. I would like to also invite the Highline Church family to please stand. They've had a big part in Miley's uh, Christian walk as well. And we're so thankful and grateful that you're all here. I just have three questions for you, Miley. Do you love the Lord Jesus with all of your heart, mind, and soul? Yes, I do. Do you believe that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you for all of your sins and has given you a new heart? Yes, I do. Is it your desire, symbolized through baptism, to join God's last day remnant movement, the Seventh Day Adventist Church? Yes. I do. It is a privilege as minister of the gospel and as your uncle to baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. First thing that led me personally into addiction was was painkillers and, and cocaine. Um, I had to do them every day, and I had to do them to go to, you know, to get out of bed. I had to do them to go to work. I had to do them, um, or else I was sick and not able to do anything. Um, and then at some point during that that living um, that living hell, um, I, I crossed the path of crystal meth, and I brought crystal meth home. Um, to, to our house and we, we did it and uh, from that point on it was we thought we'd hit rock, rock bottom before but we had, we had, had no idea how low you could go and over the next two and a half years we uh, um, I mean we, we went from you know having okay jobs um, a place to live to uh, there was times where we were homeless living out of our car been disavowed by every everybody uh, family members um, living in hotels um, on the you know lost lost our son uh, in essence um, and uh, it, it reached a, a, a breaking point weekend party um, just turned into a prison I was so far into my addiction that I was just angry and deluded into thinking that I still had it together and that I'm still a good mom. Um, I still take care of him. I still feed him. He's still clean. Um, but I'm driving around in my car high with my child. I was just scared that, you know, I was going to get in trouble and that they were going to take my son from me, which is what happened anyways. And so at that point, I mean, I just had a real, you know, down on my knees um, moment. And I'll do whatever it takes. So tell me where to go. So they gave me a list of phone numbers. 
and said, get into one of these places if you want your life back, if you want your son back. You've got to go to treatment, the judge told me. We didn't know the, the steps that God was, was taking in our lives, but uh, it led us to a place where Amy was able to, to go in uh, for a couple of weeks to a month, and then um, some, uh, my parents had Isaac, and then she was able to get Isaac and go through treatment with Isaac. I went into treatment the first time, and I, I probably hadn't slept in five days and uh, went into treatment. And I thought it was going to be, um, you know, good yoga. food. Yeah, yoga and stuff like that. I did not go to that type of treatment facility. At five in the morning, you know, they drag you out of bed and uh, make you start cooking breakfast and stuff like that. So I, after two days of that, I, I walked out of, uh, out of treatment and said, forget this, and, and left. And uh, I, I went to the worst hotel in Albany, Oregon, and took about a two-day nap and woke up and uh, that was my moment of clarity. I still know the time and place. Uh, it was the Value Inn and uh, um, just right off the freeway uh, in Albany and uh, I, I realized right then that um, I was going to lose absolutely everything if I if I didn't you know change my life. I remember looking in the mirror um, and, and realizing it and, uh, and I said Okay, I'm done. I'm never doing drugs or alcohol again. I came back to the treatment place and, uh, you know, whatever anybody in the recovery world told me to do from that point forward, I did. The motivation absolutely was Isaac in the beginning. I didn't want to get clean for myself. I didn't like myself. I thought I was the biggest piece of on the planet and I just deserved to die. But I wanted my boy, and I wanted something better, and I wanted to change that. Yeah, I got, I got sober for for my my son. I, I stay sober for myself. After resetting my life, I, I took a job. We'd been up here about a year or maybe not even a year, and I was at work, um, and uh, my, uh, my finger got caught in a tractor hitch. A, a hitch slipped and absolutely smashed uh, the tip of my middle finger um, into a, pretty much into a bloody pulp. Um, I was uh, luckily close to an urgent care, um, so hopped in the work truck and wrapped it up with a shop towel and uh, drove to urgent care, where when I showed them my finger, they quickly rushed me to the back. This is where I uh, had the, the blessing of my life and ran into uh, Dr. Hartley. Uh, he took a look at my finger. Um, they did some x-rays. He started, started working on it. And uh, we both you know, like to talk and are friendly people. And our conversation led to a couple places. And uh, I uh, let him know that there was some scar tissue in the finger because my dad had, had sewn it up when I was about five years old from it getting kind of a similar accident. Um, he asked where my, you know, where my dad went to medical school, and I said Loma Linda. And he said, "Well, that's a Seventh Day Adventist school." Do you? I said, "Yeah, you know, I was brought up Seventh Day Adventist." And he mentioned that there was a lovely church in the area, and I hadn't been seen at it yet. And uh, um, you know, after some planning and um, you know, in between putting the finger back together, it was it was arranged that we were going to, you know, go to church um, and. Meet uh, Bill and Bill and Cindy at church. I, I still am, am amazed that here I am, this you know, dirty um, guy coming off of a chicken farm who smelled horrible and you know had engine fluid all over him. That uh, Dr. Hartley spent took the time to uh, to speak with me and and offer me this uh, this hand that uh, changed my life. So after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua. It's a privilege for me to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Paul, an honor for me to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost. We too 
as a church family join in that same commitment that we would do our part in supporting them and their children to grow up to serve. God, thank you for the opportunity you've given us to live according to your will. It's my prayer in your name. Our theme this year at camp meeting is living generously. And that doesn't just mean with our resources as far as our, our money goes, but it also means living generously with our time. My name is Tyler Long, and I coordinate evangelism and church growth here for the Washington Conference. And I'm privileged here to stand next to Pastor Ofa, my pastor, at North Cascade. And we've got our good friends here, Paul and Amy. And we're going to invite Paul and Amy to come over here. Let's grab a microphone. Now, I, I didn't tell Paul this, but, you know, after you're baptized, we invite you to camp meeting to read poetry up front. So <laughs> I'm joking about that. I told him no surprises. We are so glad that you guys are here with us this morning. And uh, your family, Isaac and Addie, are over in the kids' programs having a good time. And, you know, just part of the video, there's more to the video that we weren't able to, to fit in there, but when you went to get your finger, in essence, sewn back on, Dr. Hartley, he wasn't supposed to be at work that day. Uh, no, no, I later found out that uh, Dr., Dr. Hartley wasn't supposed to be working that clinic. He was actually supposed to have the day off, and uh, he wasn't real happy about being there. Somebody um, had called in sick or something some, happened, somebody, and he got somebody, called in on his day off. Yep, he got called in on his day off, and about 10 in the morning, I walked in with, you know. With that, was a, that was a divine appointment. It was. That only God could arrange. And then, so Dr. Hartley invites you guys to church. That week, you shared with me, you went and did a little shopping, had to get some clothes, and, and, and you come to church. Now you're sitting in your, your, your truck, you're sitting there in the church parking lot. You didn't just walk right in the church, but you're sitting there having a conversation with each other. What was that conversation like, Paul? We, we were very nervous about walking into a new... We, we kind of had a feeling that things were going to change in our life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember specifically sitting there and, uh, you know, saying to my wife, it's not too late, we can, we can not go in. We could, <laughs> we could just drive off at this point. And my, my wife, being braver than I am, said, no, we're, we're going to do this. And, and uh, we went in, and um, Dr. Bill and, and Cindy uh, were waiting for us, and it was just a, an amazing day. Um, they, they brought us over to, to Potluck, and it's where we got to meet Pastor Ofa. Um, actually, it was uh, out at uh, Bill and Cindy's house, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I remember getting back in the car, and Amy just said, I think we found our church. And in fact, yeah. I know we did. So. I think we found our church. Uh, Pastor O, share with us a little bit about the Bible studies and a little bit about uh, what, what's going on right now. We initially started off, Paul and Amy and I, and, uh, to uh, start off Bible studies, and then uh, they got uh, real acquainted with uh, Bill and Cindy Hartley and then Jeff and Sarah Rowland, and so they started doing uh, Bible stu studies with Paul and Amy, and tell us how that uh, 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 every every Sunday we would meet um, at, at somebody's house and we went through the um, two, two series of the, the Bible studies and um, before we were baptized we wanted to, to, to he's all right <laughs> to, he's, a, he's a future preacher he is he is <laughs> um, it, it, yeah, we would go through the, the series every, every Sunday night, and over a couple of months, we, we got through it, and um, bo both sets of the, um, the Rollins and the Hartleys mm -hmm. are, are, are just are gifts in our life from God, yeah. uh, absolutely amazing people. So. Yeah. Awesome. And so as that was Bible studies, we did the baptism, and after the baptisms, um, how has this impacted not only your lives, but your children? How has that? It's impacted our children so much in the positive. Um, they have more self-confidence. They know God loves them. Uh, they walk around singing um, songs that they learned in Sabbath school all the time. It's just been the greatest blessing. And your son Isaac is going in the first grade with, with Pastor Ofa's son. Mm -hmm. And then your daughter Addie 
is going in the kindergarten at Skagit Adventist Academy with my little guy, Nathaniel. Yes. And I just want to apologize in advance for whatever <laughs> Nathaniel does this next school year. <laughs> All right? Okay. You're my witness. We're just apologizing. He gets it from his mother, <laughs> not from his dad. Oh, yeah. Hey, we got some gifts. We have some gifts here for the kids. That you're a part of the family. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We love you guys. You know, I tell you, we're gonna we're gonna take up an offering here this morning. You'll notice there's an offering envelope on your seat, or you might be sitting on it, or the person next to you might have sat on your offering envelope. But you know, I want to encourage you to pull that out. In fact, I've got mine uh, somewhere. I had one. Here we go. It's right here. As you open it up, you'll see there's different areas you can put a dollar amount. I want to encourage you to remember your pledges. But I want you to know that when you give this morning, you're not, understand me, you're not giving to the church, but rather you're giving this morning, you're giving through the church, which allows us to continue to change lives. You know, there's a lot of great ministries out in the world to support, a lot of great ministries, but the offering that we take up this morning, it stays here locally. It, it, it stays here in western Washington for evangelism and soul winning and Bible study material and seminars and a thousand ways to reach people for Christ. But you know, as I watched the video this morning with you of Paul and Amy, what really stood out in my mind is the, the Hartleys and the Rollins, these two families that were given Bible studies, to invite somebody to church. It didn't take, you know, board approval. There was no budget involved in that. To invite somebody then to your home for lunch and then to start Bible studies and, and to order a couple sets of Bible studies, I mean, it, maybe it cost $20. There was no fundraising involved in getting that, but what it took was being generous with your time. I don't want to take away from encouraging you to be willing to give this morning to local evangelism, but much more than just writing a check or a credit card number or doing a pledge this morning, my prayer, my challenge today is that you would also this next year be willing to give time, to invite somebody to church, to invite somebody to start Bible studies or video lessons and to see what God can do. Because truth be told, the money that we collect this morning is not our greatest resource. You are the greatest resource that we have here in Western Washington. Amen? We can't do this. We can't win people for Christ without you, without your prayers, and without you inviting the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. I want to encourage you to look at this offering envelope. You know, we're only taking up an offering during camp meeting for evangelism on Friday night, on Saturday morning, and on Saturday night. Just three times over each week. And so during the week, we're not going to be taking up uh, our, our, our normal offering. And you can see on the banners on, the, on my right and on my left, you can see our goal this year is $300,000. Now, we don't always reach that goal during camp meeting, but throughout the year, because of your generosity, we do. You see, last year in 2016, after last year's camp meeting and up until this camp meeting, we actually raised a little over $500,000 for evangelism. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the money stays here local pays for seminars. You know, this last spring we had the Voice of Prophecy campaign at the PL Fairgrounds. Over 20 churches involved. Would you like to hear about that? You've got to come back next weekend. <laughs> and we'll share that with you. But I want to thank you for giving this morning. I'm going to invite our ushers to stand. And you should have some white buckets, plastic buckets down by your feet. I'm going to say a prayer. And then I'm going to invite you to go ahead and begin to pass those buckets down. I want to thank you for coming here this morning, and I want to thank you for investing in local evangelism. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for today. We want to thank you 
for evangelism, that we can follow the example of Jesus and point people to you. We serve a good God. We're glad, Father, that you are in control, that you are sitting on the universe and you control it and you control our lives. But, Father, there are a lot of lives out here in our community. There are other Paul and Amy's out there in the community, and their lives seem out of control because of addictions, because of broken families. But what we've seen here this morning, Lord, through Paul and Amy and, 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 and their three wonderful kids, we have witnessed a family tree being changed. And we thank you and praise you for that. Father, we pray that you would take the money this morning, that it would glorify you, that you would multiply it, and that through our generosity, you would not only bless us, but many more would come to know the precious truth of Jesus Christ. We thank you and love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go for it. I want to be ready, I want to be ready, I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem just like John. I want to be ready, I want to be ready, I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem just like John. Oh John, oh John, now didn't you say? Oh. Walk in Jerusalem just like John That you be there on that great day Walk in Jerusalem just like John I want to be ready I want to be ready I want to be ready To walk in Jerusalem just like John I want to be ready I want to be ready I want ready to walk in Jerusalem just like John. King Jesus rides in the middle of the air. Walk in Jerusalem just like John. I pray the Lord will all be there. Walk in Jerusalem just like just like John. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want Walk in Jerusalem, great day, great, great day, the righteous marching, great day, walk in Jerusalem just like John, oh I want to walk, in Jerusalem just like John, I want to walk, in Jerusalem just like John, walk. in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem just like John, I'm gonna walk, in Jerusalem just Before I pray, could we just have a moment of silence? Father and God of our ancestors, you have given us another day of life and the privilege of attending another camp meeting service. This is the one time within our calendar year whereby you bring us together, churches and persons of all ethnicities to worship you, the only true and living God. We come before you at the invitation of the Holy Spirit. We invite you to come into our hearts 
And wherever there is darkness within our hearts, let the light of Jesus' love shine deep. Forgive us for each and every sin we have committed. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For your mercy endureth forever. We pray for our loved ones who are not here this morning for whatever reason. We pray for the families who are challenged. And we ask, Lord, that you would strengthen each and every one of us to continue to move closer to you and your kingdom that shall soon come. We would also ask, Lord, that you would anoint our speaker this morning with a special anointing take complete control of his mind, his body, his tongue, his soul. Make each and every one of us, under the sound of my voice, make us one, Father, even as thou art in heaven, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you been blessed this morning? For those that were in this building during Sabbath school, my heart was especially touched at the ministry of music through our young people. And now we get to hear the heralds? Are you kidding me? It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Just after the heralds share one more number with us, the next voice you will hear will be that of Bill Knott. One could recite all of the pedigree of educational and professional accomplishments. To that we would nod and we would smile, but the real heart of Bill is that of a husband and a very proud dad, for good reason, and mostly the heart of a pastor. When a pastor accepts a call to different responsibilities, it is sometimes with a sense of loss to minister to one congregation. That was a call Bill took about 20 years ago. He now serves as editor of the Review, and I would imagine that his presence is in each and every one of your households, on a table or a rack somewhere there. As the reporting of this amazing worldwide movement we know as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and how we communicate one with the other has continued to change over the years. I am very grateful for men of God like Bill. I am very grateful that we will get to hear live and in person in just a moment his heart for God and his heart for God's church. But first we will hear another number by the heralds. Thank you. Yeah. 
I felt your touch upon me and still I find I'm longing to know I hunger for your blessing and there will be no resting until you bless me, Lord. Bless me. Well, I won't tell you again, it's hard to preach here. <laughs> every time I turn a corner, every time I take a hundred steps, I meet someone who over the years has poured themselves into my life. It's a hard place to preach. Because if I start thinking about all those stories, and the gifts so many of you have poured into my life, I'd never be able to make it through a sermon. So this morning, it's an act of will to turn to the Word of God and to preach something bigger than me and my emotions. Ever since I left the Northwest 20 years ago and went to Washington, D.C. area, I have thought a great many times about how fortunate we were for the years we spent in Walla Walla and the times when we came over Snoqualmie Pass and came to where it's green and lovely. And the people we met here have continued to be important in our lives ever since. The ministry I'm engaged in now is one that 
gets me the opportunity to travel many places and meet many people. The opportunity to learn about this worldwide movement firsthand and to see believers giving their all to the Lord they love. Those are the stories we write about in Adventist Review and Adventist World. Those are the stories I love to tell. The people who, not for a paycheck or not for some sense of heavenly mansions, but because they love the Lord Jesus, are committing themselves to winning their friends and neighbors. I want to thank you for being one of those people because that's the kind of people who come to camp meeting. Today on your way out, if you didn't pick one up last night, pick up a copy of the newest edition of Adventist Review. If you don't have it in your home, think about that. But take a look at that magazine as an illustration of what we're trying to do to unite a worldwide community of more than 20 million Seventh-day Adventists and those who will yet be Seventh-day Adventists. Turn with me in Scripture today to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, and we're going to begin reading at verse 11. Luke 7, 11 through 17. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her, and he said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the funeral stretcher, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. After school, and certainly on every holiday, the four of us used to play at healing out in the stone garden under a clear blue Texas sky. I'm not quite sure which of us first invented the game or even if any of us would want to claim credit for it today. Maybe it came about because of all those stories we had heard in Sabbath school about missionary doctors and nurses toiling over broken bodies in far-off jungle places. Maybe it came about because first graders had spent too much time watching medical dramas on television. In any event, by halfway through first grade, the game was firmly established. Keith would bring with him an old stethoscope that he somehow managed to smuggle out of the house every afternoon. Kathy would bring with her a variety of kitchen utensils that had been magically transformed into surgical instruments. I would bring along my red and silver Etch-a-Sketch machine. You remember it. And Tina, well, as I remember it, Tina didn't have to bring anything along. Tina had the sweetest smile that a first-grade boy ever fell in love with. Children's games, as we remember, have very definite roles and rules to them. Things have to be done decently and in the same order, or else the game dissolves. And in our age-old version of the game of medicine, the patient for the day would lie down on an open bench in the stone garden that had been miraculously transformed into a surgical operating table. With knowing looks, the doctor of the hour would lean over and murmur wise observations to the attending nurse, who of course was Tina. The electrocardiogram machine would be called for, better known as the Etch-a-Sketch. It would be laid upon the patient's heart. 
And by turning the white plastic dials of that at your sketch, you could create the wildest arrhythmias you ever did see. <laughs> Truth is, the supposed heartbeats on that etch a sketch look more like the gyrations of my 401k recently. <laughs> if you wanted to show that the patient was desperately ill, all you had to do was crank the dials or flatline him. It was the patient's role, of course, to patiently endure all of this, to moan and groan at all the appropriate intervals. Sometimes, if you felt particularly daring, you would even feign unconsciousness, from which only the ministrations of Nurse Tina could resurrect you. <laughs> You would awake from your comatose condition to find Dr. Keith leaning over you with that curious little half-smile of his while Nurse Tina looked on adoringly. Because children are incurable optimists, no one ever died during our little game of medicine. At very worst, a patient would only appear to have died. The whole point of the game was the exercise of superior skill by the medical staff that had saved yet another difficult case. Oh, the games, the games that children play. What a strange prophetic forecast they give for our futures. Today, Keith is a successful psychiatrist practicing in Denver. Kathy went on to earn a doctorate in nursing. Tina, well, Tina broke the mold, but then again, Tina always broke the mold. And I, I make so bold as to stand behind pulpits week after week and talk about what it means to be healed. That game we played in the stone garden after school has become the stuff of our everyday lives. We never allowed for death in those backyard games as children. Every sick patient would eventually recover. Every wounded cowboy or Indian would rise to play the game another day. Our, our little world was built on the unsubstantiated belief that life always goes on. Recovery always happens. As long as there's life, there's hope. For us as children, hope and life and play were all inextricably mingled. But the story that Luke tells us in the seventh chapter of his gospel brings us squarely up against a moment when no one felt at all like playing because no one had any hope left. Hope had disappeared as quickly as had the last struggling breaths of that sturdy young man who now lay dead on the funeral stretcher. His teeth still clenched in one last spasm of pain. His curly black hair still damp with the perspiration of his last fever. There is something about the death of children to which we human beings will never be reconciled. We can sometimes, in the course of things, accept or understand the death of an elderly person who's lived a long and fruitful life. In our own quiet way, we knew that day might come. We can sometimes even come to terms with the death of a middle-aged person through, through accident or illness, even though it leaves a family lost, perhaps without a leader. But nothing, nothing in our bones disposes us to understand the death of children, our children or anybody's children. There's something profoundly unnatural about children preceding their parents to the grave. It, it scares us. It scars us worse than any other fear we have. 
With the death of children comes the death of hope. The future, far from being bright, oh, it just becomes a long, gray corridor of time. And on that day in the village of Nain, I suspect that people who otherwise never went to funerals, they came out that day to walk behind this unnamed widow as she followed the body of her only son down for burial. Her loss was more than just her loss. The whole village felt it keenly. Not only had death dealt a blow to a young man they loved, but death had, had dealt a double blow by blasting their hopes as well. If young men like this, like him, could be cut down in the prime of life. Could life ever again be sweet? Could children ever again play in the street their, their funny little games of rabbi and doctor and carpenter? It's very likely that the entire town had turned out for this funeral in the hilltop village of Nain. And just now, as Luke shows us the scene, the somber procession is passing out through the gates of the city, down toward the cemeteries, which even to this day line the road to Nain. It was the worst of all possible days for a funeral. A bright sun hanging in mid-heaven, so cheerful and warm. Songbirds twittering in the olive trees along the route. Fields of ripening wheat blowing in a light breeze down on the valley floor. The snow-capped heights of Mount Hermon shining against a blue sky in the north. Oh, it was the worst possible day for a funeral. Everything in the natural world conspired to sing a song of hope, a song of praise. And everything in the human world sang a song of woe and the death of hope. An entire village was going down down the steep, rocky road to the cemetery down from the safety and the companionship of the houses huddled on the hill, down to the lonesome caves to bury their dead. Mourners, professional ones and, and real ones, were, were filling the air that morning with wails and sobs. It, it was hard to know on that painful morning who was crying because they had been paid to cry, and who was crying because their heart was ready to break in two. The funeral stretcher was probably carried by the young men of the village, probably the friends of the one who had died. Each one of them, knowing the awful weight of carrying someone they loved down to his final resting place. Do you know that weight? I do. Too many times. I do. And at just that moment, as providence would have it, Jesus and his disciples were going up, up that same steep, rocky path to the hilltop village of Nain. It was a place Jesus undoubtedly knew very well. Nain was a mere six miles, a 90-minute walk from his hometown of Nazareth. He had undoubtedly been there dozens of times in the 28 years he spent in Nazareth. And chances are he had many friends in that hilltop town. He knew every turn in the twisting road that led up from the valley of Esdralon where, where Deborah and Barak had defeated crafty Sisera. Up past the town of Endor, where discouraged Saul had gone to seek the spirit of dead Samuel. Up past the olive groves, up past the cemeteries, up toward the gate of the city. 
Two great crowds of people were on the march that morning, one of them sad, discouraged, frantic with grief. And the other one buoyant, cheerful, because they had among them the one who called himself the resurrection and the life. It was as if a wedding party had confronted this funeral at an intersection. And no one knew quite what to do. Should you blow the horns and let the tin cans rattle? Or should you be somber and turn on the headlights and wear black? Jesus' sensitive eyes quickly sized up the situation. He was on a collision course with a grieving widow and her dead son. Unless he told his followers to step aside, the two groups on the path would soon be so hopelessly intermingled that no one would know who was going up and who was going down. Disciples with thanksgiving on their lips would soon be surrounded by a sea of mourners sobbing their hearts out. Desperate people, broken in their grief, would soon be surrounded by disciples singing the praise of Jesus' latest miracle. But Jesus cared very little for the etiquette of the situation, my friends. He cared very little about the ceremony because he knew that he had both the will and the power to bring that mourning to an end. The scripture tells us in one translation that when he saw this widow, his heart went out to her. His heart went out to her. What a beautiful idiom that is. How wonderfully it captures the response of Jesus when he meets any hurting person like you or like me. His heart goes out to us. He saw her grief for what it was. It was the broken-hearted lament of a woman who was now without hope, just as surely as she was without money or resources, with no husband to support her, with no son to care for her in her old age. She would now be reduced to living off the generosity of her friends. She might even end up begging for bread. There would be no grandsons to, to bounce on her knee one day. There would be no shy little granddaughters to tug at her skirts and say, Grandma, tell us what it was like in the olden days. No, there would be no one else to talk with. On those long nights when the other village women retreated into their homes with their husbands and their children, all her hopes lay dead and cold on that funeral stretcher she walked behind. And she was burying more than her son that day, and she knew it. Discouraged, disheartened people don't last so long. You know that story. Chances are that failing health and loneliness would drive her to an early grave of her own. This would not be the last funeral in that family. And at just the moment when we would have expected Jesus to put an arm around her shoulder and stand there beside the body and shed tears as he would do at the tomb of Lazarus, he says a very surprising thing. Don't cry, he says, or as some of your better translations have it, you can stop crying now. That's a pretty curious thing to be saying at a funeral. In 38 years of conducting funerals, I have never even once thought of saying, don't cry, or you can stop crying now. Right at the moment when we would have expected Jesus to be validating her feelings and, and telling her that her tears would do her good and offering her his broad shoulder to cry on, he, he seems to suggest that there's no reason to go on crying. Don't cry, he says, you can stop crying now. My friends, in case you haven't noticed it before, Jesus is always doing surprising things. 
At just the moment we think he will act in some predictable way and do the thing we've always expected, he does something that was nowhere on our radar screen. When we've just accomplished something great, and it's bringing us the praise of our peers, and our hearts are swelling with pride, Jesus says to us, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And when we're feeling so wretched and so low about ourselves, that we think that no one as holy and pure and righteous as Jesus would ever want to have anything to do with slime like us. Jesus says to us, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. When we're planning revenge on someone who's abused us and salivating at the thought of how they will suffer, Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. Love those who persecute you. And when we're sure we've blown it big, ruined all our chances at eternal life, Jesus says the Son came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Do you believe it this morning? If you want to worship a predictable Lord, my friends, you will not be following Jesus. If you want a safe and uneventful discipleship, you will not be following Jesus. For it's Jesus who thrives on surprise. It's Jesus who delights in what we call dilemmas. It's Jesus who revels in resurrection. And on that morning of mourning, Jesus took grief and he turned it on its head and he brought it up dancing. He had declared that it was the essence of his mission to reverse the painful, hurting, broken condition of people like you and me. To preach good news to the poor, he said to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, cause the blind to see, and the release of all who were oppressed. And you know, when you have that as your mission statement, you can afford to say a few surprising things, even on days like funerals. The Scripture doesn't tell us how this widow reacted to his strange command that she should cease crying. doesn't tell us if the tears freeze dried on her face when she realized it was Jesus talking to her. Or if, on the other hand, she looked at him in bewildered disbelief that a stranger could say something so horrible on her worst day. We don't know. We don't know if she might have been a lifelong friend of Jesus whose heart just sprang up with joy when she saw him coming up the path. Or if, on the other hand, she felt like she was being taunted in her moment of supreme bitterness. But whatever feelings his words provoked in her, Jesus didn't leave her waiting a long time to figure out why he said what he did. Luke tells us that he immediately stepped over to the funeral stretcher and he did something no rabbi and no priest and no Pharisee in all the land would have done in a similar situation. He reached out and he put his hand on it. Now to us, who are used to seeing mourners frequently touch a casket with gestures of affection, saying farewell, it's hard. It's hard for us to understand how the Jews of Jesus' time thought of the presence of death. According to the law of Moses, anyone who even touched a dead body or the bed on which a dead body lay was prevented for a time from entering the presence of the Lord. In the language of the day, they were ceremonially unclean. Jesus risked defilement because he unnecessarily came in contact with the dead body. Jesus risked the probability 
that he would be barred from the synagogue on the next Sabbath by some unctuous elder who said, you're not clean. But as he did on so many other occasions, Jesus showed no fear of the criticism of his enemies when he was going about the business of making people whole and healing wounded hearts. He risked defilement with virtually every person that he healed, with every leper, with every demoniac, with every crippled woman, with every paralyzed man. And I like to think, my friends, that he did it all with a laugh and a look in his eye that said, come now, be serious. How does making someone else whole make me unclean? It's a good question. How does making someone else whole make me unclean? And then Jesus said something to that still and lifeless form on the funeral stretcher that no rabbi and no priest and no Pharisee in all the land would have ever dared to say because it would have been blasphemously impossible for them to carry it out. Young man, I say to you, get up! Now it falls to those who stand behind this desk to give good advice. So I'm going to give some. If you're going to make a habit of going to funerals and telling the dead to get up, you'd better have the power to make it happen. <laughs> or there are going to be a lot of angry mourners ready to tear you limb from limb. But you know, my friends, Jesus was in no danger from disappointed people that day or any day. He held then, and he holds now, uncreated, unimaginable power in his hands. He calls the dead to life more easily than I wake up my son from an afternoon nap. And on that strange, confusing morning so long ago, the word that created suns and moons and planets, it penetrated the ears of that dead young man and recreated in him the ability to both hear and understand and respond. And Luke, the doctor, ever interested in the medical details, he says the dead man sat up and began to speak. I bet he did. I bet he did. Can you imagine, friends, what it would be like to lose consciousness and go under, surrounded by dozens of grieving relatives and friends in your home, knowing that this was probably your last moment on earth? And then, then wake up in the middle of a funeral procession five feet off the ground? I'd love to know what he said. I, someday I expect to find out. Did he pick up in mid-sentence where he had left off telling his mother not to cry? Was he possibly in the midst of a long list of things he was confessing because he thought his last hour had come? Was he in the middle of handing out all of his prized possessions to his friends who would now have to give them back? How bewildering to be the last person on the scene to know what was going on. But if there was any bewilderment or confusion or embarrassment on his part, I'm sure it quickly disappeared when he looked into the face of Jesus. When you think about it, my friends, at the height he was being carried, it is quite literally true that the first thing he saw when he opened his eyes from the sleep of death was nothing other than the face of Jesus. This unnamed young man, resurrected at the gate of his own hometown, he was the first one to experience the consolation with which so many millions of Christians have closed their eyes in the sleep of death since then, knowing for certain that the next thing they will see on that great getting up morning is nothing other than the face of Jesus. Like him, the righteous dead that day are going to sit up and begin to talk. But instead of continuing their confessions or handing out their estates, I have this idea that what every resurrected tongue is going to be saying on that morning is something like, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain 
to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing all praise to the gentle healer. My friends, I wanted you to use those rusty, sacred imaginations of yours this morning. I want you to think for a moment of what it must have been like to be outside the walls of Nain on that morning so long ago when, when Jesus simply spoke a word that brought a young man back to life and gave a widow back her only son. When he proved conclusively that he's the Lord over sin and death. Do you think, my friends, do you, do you think that the people in the crowd just sort of quietly turned around and dispersed back to their individual homes? Do you think, my friends, that all those who had just witnessed the foretaste of the final defeat of Satan turned to each other and said, well, that was nice. Wonder what we're having for lunch. Do you think, my friends, that all of those deliriously delighted people, all of those ecstatic ex-mourners, do you think they just sort of shuffled away and picked up their tools and their dust cloths and went back to their chores. Friends, I don't know about your sacred imaginations today, but I can tell you what I see in mine. I see a crowd of people almost leaping into the air out of sheer excitement for what Jesus has done. I hear a thunder of voices outside the walls of Nain as we all pick up the language of the psalmist and hurl it to the sky. You have turned our mourning into dancing, Lord. Our feet are filled with your praise. I feel the strong arms of God's people wrapped around me as we lift up our praise to the one who always heals. You see, my friends, this morning, I participate by faith in the victory of Jesus Christ. I share this morning in the triumph of His healing power. I draw strength this morning from the knowledge that 2,000 years ago, a gentle healer named Jesus brought a dead young man back to life. And that soon, and very soon, He's going to call me and those I love on to life eternal. But I have to admit, I have been having an argument with the Lord recently. It's an argument about where I want to be on resurrection morning. You see, part of me wants to be in a little grassy hillside cemetery in the Berkshires of western Massachusetts, where just five and six years ago, we laid my mother and my father to rest, along with my grandfather, my grandmother, my aunts, my cousins, my uncles. Precious dust. I want to be there in the Maple Grove Cemetery on resurrection morning. But I also want to be on the east side of Syracuse, New York on resurrection morning. I just got to see my Italian grandparents who came to Jesus at midlife and came to this truth at midlife. I've just got to see them coming back to greet Jesus when he comes. I've got to be in Syracuse on resurrection morning. And I've also got to be in a little town called Bedford, Michigan on resurrection morning for there lies one of God's most original creations 37 years ago this fall I started seminary with my best friend sharing a basement apartment we had been best friends and prayer partners all the way through academy and college had each spent a year interning in conferences and then met at seminary, threw in together, shared a basement apartment, and three weeks into that first term at the seminary, one morning Jeff went that way in his car to class, and I went that way, and Jeff never got there. 
This was the man I knew would one day be the best man at my wedding. This was the man who, as a pastor, would one day dedicate my children. This was the man whom I expected would always be the one at the other end of the phone line to to laugh and talk and pray about what life was bringing us. But today he, he sleeps in a churchyard cemetery in Bedford, Michigan. So I've got to be in Bedford, Michigan on resurrection morning. And I also have to be in Beltsville, Maryland on on resurrection morning because there's another grave of another best friend, George Kretschmar. Fifteen years ago, pancreatic cancer claimed this man of wit and love and laughter. Every day I drive by that memorial park and I think about the day when Jesus will come in power and great glory and I've got to be in Beltsville, Maryland on resurrection morning. You know, friends, I don't know how the Lord is going to work all this out. But I am quite certain I will be satisfied. I will be satisfied. My friends, not only do I believe that Jesus can bring a dead disciple back to life, but I've come to believe in recent months that Jesus can bring comatose congregations and uh, quiescent conferences back to life as well. He can bring unmoving unions and ossified organizations and ambivalent associations back to life as well. He can do all those things. Thank God that in His grace this body has never died. But let's be truthful. Around the corners of Adventism and in the hallways and the churches of Adventism, it is not a time of health and prosperity. In so many places, the body has grown smaller as people stay away or get turned away or feel a sense of loss and stop attending. Parts of the body have become entirely inactive. Hands and feet that used to do the work of caring and sharing, they've almost gotten paralyzed with disuse. Legs and feet that ought to be running errands of mercy, they've spent a lot more time propped up in front of television sets and video games. Throughout the body of this church, there is in so many places a sense of woundedness, both personal and corporate. The woundedness of individuals, the hurts they carry, the hurts we carry, have become the hurts of the movement. And right now, as never before, my friends, we are in need of the touch of a gentle healer. But my friends, as I said a moment ago, I do have a sacred imagination. And I'm here to tell you today that it works real well. I'm here in the name of that gentle healer to tell you that I see a future for this denomination in which healing abounds. I see a future for this people in which broken, shattered lives are made whole. I see a future where where lonely, discouraged people come to church and they find friends and companions. I see a future in which sinful, broken people find forgiveness. They find restoration. I see this movement as a place where the victims of sexual abuse and their victimizers can both find recovery and cleansing in Jesus. I see this body as a place where those who are struggling with addictive behaviors will find not more criticism and more censure, but they'll find understanding and encouragement. I see this body as a place where those who have had the self-esteem almost crushed out of them will have the arms of God's people wrapped around them. I want to be part of a healed body, my friends. I want to be part of a healing community. 
I want to be part of a church that, like its Lord, is unafraid of sin and unafraid of dirt. A church that wades in where things are hard, wraps its arms around sinners and says, we'll stand here with you. If that's the church you want to belong to, my friends, then just raise your hand to heaven. If that's the church you want to be engaged with, raise your hand so that heaven can see it and so the people around you with their eyes open can see it too because you're making a pledge to be part of a healing community. Do you share that sacred imagination? Do you long for this movement to be more than it is? Do you long for it to be a place that radiates the wholeness and the healing and the recovery that's found in Jesus? then go out now and in his name make a difference make a difference I lift up him today as the one who has made a difference in my life who brought me joy at midlife who restored and renewed me at a time when I didn't think it could happen I lift up my praise today to the gentle healer and if you want to praise him to pray with me now. Oh, Lord Jesus. You have a work of resurrection to do among your people today. And so we give you permission, Lord, to, to lift what's dead and dying or hurting and broken. To restore what's wounded. To create companionship for the lonely a sense of security for those in fear. Thank you for doing that for each of us individually. And now, Lord Jesus, thank you in advance for what you're going to do for us as your people as we move towards your coming. I thank you and praise you in the name above all names, even your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.